What's the joy? Why would anybody want to go into vocational ministry? That's the sweetest fruit. It's not because you gain a title or a platform or pull the biggest paycheck, uh, social media following. It's because you get to see God work through you to change lives. And holy cow, watching God change other people's lives, that's the, the most gratifying thing. Oh, what's up, my friends? Faith aficionados. This show is brought to you by ChristianPodcast.com in partnership with Palm Harvest Church in Costa Mesa, California. Are you guys ready to discover what's the leadership crisis going on in America with the church? We're about to talk with Scott Pace. I'm doing great, man. I'm super energized, uh, especially I feel like I'm about to come out of a game tunnel, like the like like break the tape, blow the smoke. Like, man, it's game time. You got me hyped. All right, go. man. It's game time. Here we go. Okay, Scott, would you introduce us real quick to who you are, a little bit of what you do, where you're tuning in from? Yeah, I'm tuning in from the East Coast. I'm in North Carolina. I'm the dean of the college at Southeastern Seminary and a professor here. Uh, at the seminary, been a, uh, in pastoral ministry for over 20 years. So I get to teach and preach and um, really invest in a lot of uh, other people who are called to do the same. Awesome. I love it. Okay. So this is what we're going to do to kick off the show. We're going to go to our belief o meter with our emojis right now. So let's find out what's the emoji to kickstart our conversation today. So the belief meter is going and it's the inspired emoji. Yes, All right. I'm inspired because we're having this conversation. You know, um, there's some things out there that are issues that are challenges we're facing, but I'm super hopeful and optimistic because I feel like God is up to something and we've got some work to do and we're about to get after it. So I'm, I'm pretty inspired by all of it. Love it. Okay. So inspire kicks us off. All right, my friends, so we are discussing the leadership crisis in America, ministers leaving vocational ministry pretty much all over the United States. Um, I'm, I'm familiar with that, even here in our town, Costa Mesa. Uh, there's several pastors that you know, have resigned in the past mm. year, in 2022. And even, you know, since the pandemic started, there were yeah. we were hearing, you know, all pastors are a living ministry and so i mean from your vantage point what are the statistics what's going on is this a big problem is this is this just for ministers what's going on yeah it's a really big problem i almost compare it to like a leadership famine you know we're entering mm. into a season where we're the the pipeline is is dry um so statistics um tell us that there's less than 15 percent of protestant pastors under the age age of 40. Uh, let, let that sink in a little bit. One other uh, frame of reference helps me a little bit. Uh, we have more Protestant pastors right now over the age of 65 than we do under the age of 40. So we've got a, a, a lot of seasoned veterans um, uh, in ministry, but we don't have a lot of aspiring future young leaders uh, who are up and lead the way. And that causes all kinds of problems. So what you were describing uh, kind of churches that don't have uh, leaders to churches that don't have young leaders that can resonate with a broader uh, kind of generational platform. Uh, and so that's a big problem, big challenge that we have right now. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's so interesting. So here, yes, my pastor, he's in his 60s, early mm -hmm. 60s. And all the time, you know, he keeps telling us here at staff, hey, I'm the oldest pastor in town. So, I mean, the statistics you're providing right now, it's a reality. There's there's really yeah. a, a gap, right, with, with people in leadership. So why do you think people are not stepping in, the, the younger generation? What's keeping them from saying, I want to pursue vocational yeah. ministry, right? There's a lot of reasons to it. I think as the church in recent, um, maybe even decades, in the last 10 to 20 years, we've emphasized, rightly so, that every member matters. So every member is a minister. Every member lives on mission. Uh, and, and that was a really important 
uh, emphasis, I think, for the church to make because so many people were putting off the work of ministry just to the pastors or to the staff. And so that emphasis was right, but we swung the pendulum so far that we we fail to ever talk about while every member matters and everybody is living on mission, whether that's as a you know a, a school teacher or a business professional or whatever it may be, um, there is still a place for vocational ministry, meaning that you do it for a career, for a living. That's, that's what God has called you to do to serve him uh, as your career and as your calling. So uh, one, we haven't extended that. We've stopped talking about that. We're not inviting people to consider it. And we've got some things like, quite honestly, we've had some people in ministry who have made some really poor decisions. They've mm-hmm. failed in ministry, whether that's a moral failure, they've compromised doctrinally, they've done things that have kind of soured people towards uh, people in ministry leadership. And so nobody really aspires to want to do that. Uh, and then the, one other factor I would say um, as it relates to why people aren't doing it is because um, w- the way we talk about ministry, when we're in ministry, we always talk about how hard it is, how difficult the people are, how uh, overworked we are, how underpaid we are. And so nobody's looking at it like, oh, I know, sign me up for that. God, please call me to ministry <laughs> or missions. I want to I want to do that uh, because of how we, we talk about it, when in reality, we should be elevating it as the privilege that it is and the honor it is to serve the Lord in a vocational capacity. So those are some of the factors, man. We're not calling people and inviting people to consider it. Um, and we've, we've done really poorly at it and we've, we've, um, you know, talk about it in a a negative way. So people aren't, haven't been gravitating towards it. Mm -hmm. So you think, I mean, is this, um, is this a cultural thing where we're situated right now where, Uh, do you think this is happening besides like the church world? Is this just happening in general or is this specific to the church world? Is this just a generational thing that's culturally happening? Now, this is a great question. And I don't think many people ask this question, but I do think in some ways it's unique to the church because in our culture, what you see is the culture empowering the younger generation and inspiring them to do more. So you see younger entrepreneurs than we've ever seen uh, going out and even doing philanthropic work. So they're serving communities and uh, charity-based things. They're, they're inspired to be a part of something greater. So our culture has actually been challenging and maybe uh, the young people do something. And quite honestly, I don't think uh, the church has lived up to that same standard. And so our young people are looking at it and saying, I can make a bigger difference outside the church than I can inside the church. And that's on the church. That's on us. That's our mm. our problem, not our culture's problem. Yes. So is that bad? I mean, is it bad that people, you know, younger leaders are saying, well, if I can do it outside of the church and I'm creating like almost like the same impact or even bigger, why would that right. be necessarily bad? Um, right? Yeah, it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and, you know, mm. and so we should be inspiring Christians to go serve in a variety of platforms and contexts and make a difference, whether that's through business or whether that's through their community and, and involvement. But it can't be at the expense of those who are also called to lead the local church. And so that's what I think we swung the pendulum too far. We actually were inspiring, encouraging other people or y- our younger people to consider those things, but we eliminated this as an option. And so nobody has been considering, man, serving Uh, in the church, the way God may have actually called and created them to do. Mm, so how do we invite people like back into like vocational ministry? You have a book that's uh, recently out called Calling Out the Call. And is that something yeah. like, is that the invitation? Like there's there's a space here for you that maybe it's been a little bit untapped lately, right? Um, yeah. yeah. How do we bring yeah, it back? Yeah, that's exactly right. So one of the things we talk about in the book is that there's a universal calling for all believers. So we're all called to uh, serve Christ and to surrender to him. And that means that we're all called to leverage our life for the greater cause, for the mission, making a difference for Christ. And then at the same time, that universal calling, there's a unique calling that some people are set apart for the work of the ministry. And so you read about it, whether it's Ephesians 4, that God you know, have, has given some leadership roles to the church for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so there you see kind of both of them blended together. Uh, So there are some leaders who are called to raise up others who can then help lead and serve within the body of Christ. And so that's really what we've got to be back about. We've got to elevate the conversation 
um, of calling out the call, inviting people to pray. God, have you called me to to vocational ministry or missions? Um, and at least consider the option that God may have done that. Mm-hmm. Where do you see? Where have you seen success in in maybe bringing people back into this calling? Uh, yeah. Are Are there any stories that you're aware of where you said, you know, here's here's a person and this is their journey and this is kind of what it looked like for them specifically? Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, I think of my own journey. I, I have an accounting degree. I went to college for mm-hmm. accounting and worked as an accountant for a couple of years and a business manager. Uh, and God called me uh, almost to a second career, if you will, uh, in the full-time ministry. And that was through um, active involvement in my local church, uh, people who cared about me, brothers and sisters in Christ who were seeing some giftedness and thought, maybe you ought to consider this. Then my own, I had some mentors and then my own personal kind of discernment there. Uh, but you know, I was talking to a pastor two weeks ago of a church here in uh, our area, and he was so convicted by the lack of leadership. The, in North Carolina right now, uh, 20% of our uh, uh, churches in my denomination, 20% of them don't have a pastor. So we have 3,000 of those churches in North Carolina, 600 of them are without a pastor right now. He was so convicted by that. Uh, the next Sunday, he invited his congregation, he challenged them. He said, some of you need to consider a career change. God has used you in this season of life as a professional in whatever capacity, and God may be calling you into ministry. And he said that week he had four of his church members individually contact him and say, I need to prayerfully consider this. God may be doing this. And so it's a matter of just elevating the conversation and letting God's spirit do the work of what he wants to do in their lives. But we have to present it as though it is an option. Otherwise, mm. how, how do they know? Man, I, I need to consider this. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's so interesting. So, uh, I mean, the, I love the fact that almost like the common people, right? Basically, what you're saying is there's people that are already doing um, basically their call, right? They're, it it yeah. could be business. It could be education. It could be yep. whatever. But then maybe there's there's still a calling that maybe God is is inviting them to consider. So what you're saying is there's right now people who might be listening, who have yep. never even considered ministry as a as a thing to explore, uh, mm-hmm. right? Maybe I don't know. Maybe the word is becoming a pastor. Maybe that's that's yeah. In a sense, it's it's a they're maybe afraid of even that word. Sure. But what you're saying is that there's something to that. There's an option. There's an invitation to that. So how can people realize, like in in your own journey, how did you go? Mm -hmm. I mean, you said there were mentors and and your own personal calling. How can people like explore that and say, I've been doing this for so long, but what if God is calling me to step in into into this specific role to fill this need? Yeah, there's a couple of ways that that, uh, happens. And I think people can, uh, can kind of find that affirmation that they're looking for. Some of it is an overwhelming desire. There's an internal burning and passion to say, I've got to do this. Or, you know, I go to my job now and all I can think about is serving the Lord in this way, you know, in this other context. Again, some people need to leverage the job where they're at for Christ. Uh, But if God has this internal passion, he's kind of fueling this, that may be an internal desire uh, that is a factor. Uh, Then you get into, hey, I'm volunteering in my church. I'm serving as a small group leader or I'm, I'm teaching or I'm doing uh, some sort of other service, community ministry, and I'm seeing that I'm gifted in this way. And so then you begin to recognize not just kind of the desire, but there's gifts, there's skills, there's abilities that God's given you. And uh, he, he kind of brings that together. And then you have the affirmation of other people, brothers and sisters in Christ, mentors, uh, other ministry leaders who may be able to recognize and say, I see this in you. Have you ever considered this? Um, And by the way, some of your listeners may actually be those people. Maybe it's not them that God's calling to consider vocational call to ministry, but maybe they need to be a voice in someone else's life that says, hey, I see this in you. Maybe you ought to consider it. So those three things. And then lastly, fruitfulness. Like when you begin to serve in a certain way and you see God using, not just working in you, but working through you, now all of a sudden you begin to see God's doing things beyond what I could do in my own strength or ability. And that fruitfulness tends to kind of be that final affirmation to say, God, this is what you want to do with my the rest of my life. So those are some of the aspects to consider, kind of that internal um, kind of desire, the giftedness and skills that God may has, have given you for a particular thing, other people speaking into you, and then fruitfulness uh, in your ministry as you serve 
uh, now. So those are some of the areas where I would encourage them to lean in a little bit. Wow, I love that. I love how you're saying there's there's the people that got maybe calling, but there's also people who got maybe calling to call. <laughs> right? That's right. Calling. That's exactly so, right. That's it. Wow, that's, it. that's so good. So um, I, I guess when it comes to, you were saying, you know, out of the 3,000 churches, that means 600 churches are without a pastor, and that's just in your mm. location, right? Yeah. So let's think about a little bit of the, like the worst case scenario, right? Mm. So what's going to happen if this, if there's nobody to step in? Are these churches going to close? Are there people who are going to be left out and, and no shepherd? Like what, what, what does that even look like for people without a, a lead pastor or that role? Is that look yeah. like people not believing? Is that look like people like, how is that even, what's the worst case scenario? Yeah, all of the above, right? Where we all of a sudden went from having an area that was saturated with the gospel witness for Christ to now all of a sudden needing a gospel witness for Christ. Because you can think about how we we uh, sometimes look at other countries in the world and think, man, they need uh, a church presence. They need uh, the gospel. This is Romans 10, right? How will they hear unless they have a, a preacher? And how will they preach unless they're sent? Like, hey, we need to send that. Well, all of a sudden, we're going to go from having a, a gospel witness there to, like you mentioned, a church is going to close their doors. Now, all of a sudden, there's a community without uh, a, a, a Christ-centered representative uh, there, and not just in terms of an individual, but in terms of a church. And so now that community begins to grow darker and darker in terms of uh, the influences there and how sin takes a hold. And so it just is going to kind of propel itself forward, and we're going to find that, that darkness growing. So we've got to take captive that darkness by sending out the light. So there's a lot of challenges there. Um, that, that I think we need to be realistic about how severe and how serious it is that if we don't address it, um, then, then we're, we're losing ground for the kingdom. Here's one other thing I would say, because sometimes we might look at that and think, well, we know that God's not going to let his church fail. But we also know that God has called us to be part of the kingdom uh, work. And so when I look at those churches, I look at what Jesus said in Matthew 9, when he looked at the people and he was brokenhearted, And he said he had, the Bible says he had compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so that's the problem we're talking about, right? There's, there's the sheep, the people of God without the leadership that God's desiring to find. And so what was his solution? Pray then to the Lord of the harvest that God would send and raise up laborers to go out into the harvest. So those laborers were also the shepherds. Those were the, the leaders that God was calling to go out into the harvest and to minister Uh, to them and to share the gospel as well. So it's a, it's, man, it's a big deal if we don't get about the business of it, you know? Yeah, there's so much. Uh, it reminds me, so I'm from Mexico, right? We were talking about how right. I'm, I'm from Guadalajara. And I guess, I don't know how many people know this, but the majority of of the population in Mexico would be considered Catholic, right? And it's almost right. like a little bit of like nominal Catholic, maybe you know, mm -hmm. go once or twice a year to church or Right. Uh, for, for ceremonies and things like that. And the interesting thing is that I remember growing up, I grew up in, in more like the Protestant uh, tradition in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I remember hearing, because I went to a Catholic university, because there's no Christian universities in Mexico. Sure. Right? Maybe there's now, but um, I'm not familiar with any. But anyways, I went to a Catholic university And I remember hearing almost the same thing you're saying and we're discussing here today, but in regards to the Catholic Church. So it was mm. a little bit more like we, we don't have priests that right. are you no know, preaching in the in the chapels or whatever they're called, right? I'm not super familiar with the, the terminology. Right. But uh it seems like it was it was a, a very similar experience for the Catholic Church, in which I remember Um, the 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 leadership of the church mm. almost like being concerned like how are we going to raise new leaders and stuff and me particularly right as a Protestant I felt right. like I I, and I I always felt like well why do I care right why do I right. care about <laughs> this so I think so I say all of that to say what if people are right now maybe even listening to this and in a sense they feel the same the same the same way I was feeling towards the mm. Catholic church, but towards the Christian church in general and say, well, why should I even care? Right. Good for them that there's, there's no leadership. 
Um, right. maybe, maybe some people are even applauding that and it's, it's even maybe a little bit of that darkness that we, you were talking about. What would right. be your words specifically for, for the people that maybe see the church in that light, right? It, with a negative lens and say, oh, that's actually good that yeah. churches are dying. What's, what would be yeah. your word for them specifically? I, I think they're basing that on, sadly, it's a commentary on what the church has become in terms of reputation, or maybe even in some cases, reality. So people view the church a certain way. And so because of that, they would draw that conclusion. Well, I'm glad because the church, as they view it in terms of a negative influence or flawed leaders, leaders who are, are leveraging their you know position for abusive leadership power or whatever it may be, um, or you know misguided motives, money. So they look at it. And if that's the case, I actually would agree with them. Mm -hmm. then great. I'm, I'm glad that those things are kind of going away. But the, the goal then wouldn't be to eliminate the church. It would be actually to put healthy leaders the way God designed it to be in those places. And why should we care about the church? Man, because that's the bride of Christ. How can we say we love Jesus if we don't love his bride? And Jesus died to redeem his bride and his people. Therefore, we have the responsibility to serve the church and be the church that God's called us to be. And some of that involves healthy, godly leaders. So the church can't be the church without the leaders that God has designed it to include. And so we, we all need to be about uh, championing, championing that, that they, that God would raise up those leaders. So, but I think that that question is important because I do think a lot of people would probably applaud it and say, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I know why in terms of the reputation and maybe the reality in some circumstances, they would feel that way. And, and, and the reality, just like you felt, in some ways, I would feel that same way, too. If we're eliminating those types of leaders, then great. But the truth is, um, that doesn't mean that we should eliminate leadership altogether. We need to put the right, healthy, godly leaders in there that should be in there. Mm, that's so good. I, I love that idea because, okay, so this is going to be a little extensive as I try to elaborate on my next point, but it's yep. centered around the idea of of the goodness of God. And I, I would say mm. even just goodness in general, right? right? So when I think of goodness, I think maybe like universal values, like sure. kindness, like love, like generosity, um, mm -hmm. right? And on and on. So w when I think of those and I think of the church, It almost seems to me like the those should be the values that the church showcases, right? And I think right. a little bit of what you're talking about when you say reputation and the reality mm -hmm. is that those values, uh, for some people and for, for right reasons that you're mentioning, are not being showcased, right? So we've been showcasing actually the opposite values of mm -hmm. those which are good. So... All that to say is when I hear people saying, you know, the church hurt me or, you know, mm. the leadership of the church hurt me. I wonder, yeah. well, if God is good and <laughs> no, no, you're, you're maybe here's a little bit of theology that you can you know, uh, help me with a little bit. Yeah. But if God is good, right, mm. maybe what we're experiencing in the church that's negative is not necessarily God. Right. In right. a sense, it's not that the church is doing their their job in a bad way, but it's more like uh, this might be a silly thought. Right. But what if Satan is doing his work really good? Yeah. And, right. right. <laughs> yeah. It, it's um, it, it's not unheard of. In fact, I think you're nailing on some of it uh, in some ways. When you think of Paul's farewell to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he actually cautioned them that there would be wolves who would come from within them. Right. And so that they had to be on guard from that. And too many times we're looking at it as though the uh, the enemy of the church is operating outside the church, when in reality, uh, he could, in fact, be operating from within the church. And I do think what you said is right. People want to forecast um, other people's abuses uh, and, 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 you know, people who have hurt them or mistreated them or uh, that type of things in terms of leadership in the church. And they want to forecast that on God. Uh, but we can't hold God at fault for what those people did. Uh, those people are, in fact, a demonstration of what you described to start with, the goodness of God. And all those universal values, you know, when you started mentioning that list, you know what came to my mind? What? The fruit of the Spirit, mm. love, joy, peace, 
patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the universal values that we would say everybody can agree that those are good things. And those are the essence of the God we serve. That is the fruit of the spirit that he should be uh, producing in us and through us that we as leaders should be representing. So I think it's really important that as we're calling leaders out that we're elevating the character values as much as we are the capabilities. Because what you said is right. We've begun elevating and spent too much time elevating some of the worldly standards of how magnetic of a personality or how dynamic they are, how gifted as a leader they are, focusing on those things rather than the character uh, that God has called us to possess and develop and grow into. And those should be the ones who are esteemed as the best leaders, not just the ones who can speak the best or um, you know, kind of showcase other kind of skills or talents, that type of thing. Oof, that's so fire right there. I love it. I love the, the, the fruits of the spirit. So yeah, um, I'm going to say for the people that are maybe considering this, right, considering either vocational ministry or inviting someone into vocational ministry, like we've said, uh, I would love to like focus a little bit on, on, on that, almost like have a, a magnifying glass yeah. and say the character of God is mm. good and it's showcased through the fruits of the spirit, right? It's 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 right. almost like the ultimate uh, version of who we should be as followers of Jesus. This should be the character that we reflect right less on. of us right and more of Him, right? And right. I think what what you said at the beginning is, I was kind of like asking this question: What is enticing in a sense about being in vocational mm. ministry? And you mentioned right. the fruitfulness. So mm -hmm. that's where I would feel like, oh, let's focus on that because I think that's a great invitation for people to consider, right? Almost like what Jesus said in, in, in the Gospels, do you want to be great? Go and serve, right? right? That's right. And I love that's that right. he's not saying don't be great. Right. He's saying there's a way to be great. And I think that's, that's through this. That's through experiencing like the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruits need to be... Right seated and watered and nurtured and then they they are showcased right so that's how you get to that kind of leadership yeah there's there's two things that, that you said made me think of uh when you said that as you as you describe uh jesus saying if you want to be great in my kingdom go serve you know uh the other parable he told as it relates to the talents where he said well done good and faithful servant too many times we would want to replace that word servant with something like well done good and faithful preacher or well done, mm -hmm. good and faithful, you know, fill in the blank singer or leader or whatever. No, no, no. Jesus said it was well done, good and faithful servant. And so if we're going to be great at any of those other roles that we would want to kind of elevate, it's got to be as a servant version of whatever that other role may be. And so servant is kind of the foundational, most important thing. The other thing, when you think about fruitfulness in ministry, uh, it's interesting in, in second Timothy two, uh, Timothy or Paul's talking to Timothy about passing the baton, what you have learned from me and trust it into other faithful men who can then entrust it into others. And he uses some different metaphors there, a soldier and an athlete, but he uses a farmer last. And he says, the farmer ought to be a hardworking farmer receives the first fruits of uh, his labor. And in ministry, you know what the fruit that remains is, and Jesus talked about that fruit that remains, the fruit that remains is the difference God makes in other people's life through us. Mm -hmm. So when I'm harvesting fruit as a, as a laborer, as a servant, it's seeing God work in their life. And you know, when you're in ministry, the sweetest thing about being in ministry is actually seeing a, a, a marriage restored or seeing that addict rescued, or it's in seeing life change happen. And you get to be a part of that. So when you say, hey, what's the... What's the joy? Why would anybody want to go into vocational ministry? That's the sweetest fruit. It's not because you gain a title or a platform or pull the biggest paycheck or whatever it may be, uh, social media following. It's because you get to see God work through you to change lives. And holy cow, watching God change other people's lives. That's the, the most gratifying thing uh, about ministry for sure. Love it. That is amazing. I love that. <laughs> and so I would say, uh, I guess my invitation would be for, or I guess the question, I, I guess my, yeah. my maybe final question on my end yeah. would be, as we think of, of the leadership that there is right now, 
Mm. Um, do you think do you think that leadership needs to be replaced? Needs to be uh, healed? Is I mean, is mm. there hope for the current leadership that might be struggling with maybe not reflecting God's character, or is that for yeah. Jesus to sort out and say, you know, I'm going to remove some people here and bring in like the the reinforcements or something like that. Like what, what's yeah. your perspective on, on current leadership? Man, I think it's, I think it's across the whole spectrum. Just what you said. I think there are in some ways, uh, leaders that God needs to remove. Um, and other leaders, it may be that God needs to reform or refine them. Uh, and then the other leaders, it may be that God just needs to, uh, kind of re, uh, and energize and reinvigorate their passion for the right things. And so you got to trust the Lord in those. I, I would say to people who are listening, you want to seek out those leaders that are doing it for the right reasons in the right way. And you can look at scripture and use that as the measuring stick uh, as to uh, whether or not their uh, leadership caliber, if you will. Uh, but at the same time, as we look in our own uh, lives, we've got to evaluate, am I being what God's called me to be? Am I being that leader? Because the truth is leadership and its basic definition is influence. And so everybody has the capacity to lead because they're influencing people around them. That's their coworkers, their neighbors, their friends, their family. And it's about leveraging that. And God may elevate that platform into a different role in terms of vocational ministry, but everyone's called to lead by measuring or leveraging their influence uh, for the cause of Christ. So I do think there's going to be some refining that has to go on. But this is the, the cool part about it. Uh, the current leaders can be part of the solution in raising up new leaders, that they can recognize areas of their own growth, and then they can challenge other people to say, hey, here's what God wants to do in this generation of leadership. Won't you come be a part of it? And that's what calling out the call is all about, about discipling that next uh, you know, generation of ministry leaders. So good. Okay, I lied. I have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it. And it's related to this idea of almost like the multi-ethnic uh, mm. reality of our nation, right? Of the United States sure. specifically. And right now, right, I'm a Latino, so I'm going to say a few things in Spanish because I want to right. maybe inspire the people that are listening who are Latinos. And si tú hablas español y estás considerando tal vez el ministerio, eh, seguir a Jesús, pero también ser un pastor. Eh, quiero que, que abras tu mente ahorita, porque a lo mejor Dios va a usarte a ti específicamente como latino. Ok, so let's go back to English. I don't know if, no, some people, I lost some people right there, but I made it short. But I want to say this, right? So if there are Latinos out there or people, no, multi-ethnic um, uh, people, right? I've been hearing a lot that there's a space for ministry when it comes to like different ethnicities and you know I've mm -hmm. been talking to other authors who have been saying you know the immigrant church in America it's it's not only here to stay but it's it's really here to help and bring almost like right. a, some sort of revival so what would be your words specifically to people who have maybe different backgrounds or ethnicities or even mm -hmm. immigrants who are here in America who have a sense of calling but don't necessarily yeah. know what's the next step maybe there's barriers because of the initiative sure. and all of that, right? What 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 would be some encouraging words? Well, one, I, I um, am, am excited about this movement towards a multi-ethnic church because I believe that's what the church in heaven will be. I think that's what we see in Revelation 5 and Revelation 7, that all the nations uh, will be represented. People of every tongue, tribe, nation, and people will be uh, in heaven. And so the church on earth should look like the church in heaven. So uh, that's, that's going to be part of that. Uh, when you look at the leaders who may be called to those specific demographics, whether it's ethnicities from their own background or their own culture, uh, I think it's vitally important to pursue that. Don't let man's barriers try to get in the way of what God's calling you to do. I look at a school like ours. Uh, we have some things that we would call like kingdom diversity initiatives that provide scholarships uh, for those who come from uh, other ethnic background, other ethnicities, other races to where they have uh, funds that, that are designed and, and really set apart, set aside uh, specifically to empower them and enable them to pursue their giftedness, their their education, and the training that they may need uh, in their um, own kind of churches and church setting, what God may be calling them to. Uh, but ultimately, my prayer is that those things would be as integrated as possible so that the church on earth can look like the church in heaven. 
So good. I love that. So I'm going to say it in Spanish right now real quick. Yep. No dejes que las barreras del hombre te impidan perseguir tu llamado. Es lo que está diciendo ahorita Scott Pace. No dejes que las barreras del hombre te impidan perseguir tu llamado. I love that. So uh, this is what we're going to do right now. We're going to go back to our emojis. Uh -oh. And we're going to summarize the episode as we walk through our belief -o meter All right. All right. So out of the five emojis, let's start with blasphemous. From your vantage point, what is the worst idea or even a blasphemous idea when it comes to the crisis in church leadership? What we talked about that said that uh, good, if the church fails or doesn't have leaders, that's a good thing. Uh, we know that's not what God's intention is, and we know that's a reflection more on our failed leadership than it is on what God has intended and desires for the church. What are you skeptical of, or where do you see skepticism played out? Yeah, I think people are skeptical of, can we get a new generation of leaders that will lead the right way? And do we need to be skeptical in that, um, is the church going to make it? Are we going to be able to solve this leadership crisis that we're facing? I think there's some real question marks there that's going to require some work and effort. Inspired. What inspires you or where do you see inspiration? Listen, this conversation that we just had shows to me that there is the possibility of what God wants to do in calling out the call, raising up a generation of ministry leaders. And that gives me hope, not just for the church today, but for the church of tomorrow. So I'm excited about that. Love it. A holy idea. Mm, that we would actually be set apart and reflect what you said and described, the goodness of God, the fruit of the spirit, that that would be the character uh, that we reflect as leaders and that we invite other people in their own walk with Christ to live uh, towards and produce that same spiritual fruit. And finally, the most divine idea you can think of. Mm. Man, that the church on earth would look like the church in heaven and that we would ultimately live out that reality, uh, not only in the diversity of our makeup, but in our faithfulness to our King and our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ himself, and that, that uh, the kingdom of heaven would, in fact, uh, God's will would be done on earth in that same way. Love it. All right, my friends. I think I froze. <laughs> <laughs> This thing is completely froze. Do you see me moving at all or am I like super frozen too? You're frozen, but I still got you. I can hear you. Oh, that's funny. All right. Well, I'll just have to put some other images at the end of the show. Okay. So Scott Pace, this is what we're going to do to wrap up the episode. Where can people go to find out more about your work, even get your resource calling out the call? Where do you want to point yeah. people to? Yeah. Hey, the book is available anywhere where books are sold. You can pick it up on Amazon or anywhere like that. Uh, there's also some supplemental resources on callingoutthecalled.com. There's some videos that we've put together that are free, downloadable. You can watch those. Those complement and supplement the book. You can access those there. Uh, so check it out. All right. Callingoutthecalled.com. My friends, I invite you to check us out at christianpodcast.com for more in-depth of our episodes as you know give us a positive review a good rating share this episode with a friend if you found value in it and i'll see you guys on the next one thank you scott thanks Pedro.